Euromax Highlights, coming up on the show, our summer special from Berlin, a European journey, and here's your host, Robin Merrill. Hello and welcome to a very special edition of Euromax Highlights. As you can see, I'm not in the studio today, but out on the streets here in Berlin. I'm standing in front of what has to be the city's most famous landmark, the Brandenburg Gate. A symbol of a divided and now a united Germany because this was where the war was. There's always lots going on around here now, including street musicians who dream of making it one day, like this amazing band who we met up with in Spain. <laughs> Ojos de Brujo, a band from Barcelona with their very own take on flamenco. It's a few hours to go before a gig in Santiago de Compostela. Maxwell Wright, Paco Lomeño and Panko Gabas all belong to the band, which has 12 members in all. Each of us adds a different musical background. That's why we're able to bring together such different styles of music. We are percussionists and guitarists. Rhythm plays a huge role in our music. The right beat is very important. It all started back in the late 1990s when nine friends met up in Barcelona to make music. In 1999, the band released their first album called Bengue. Ojos de Brujo went on a debut world tour with their second studio album in 2002. In Spain, they are superstars, but they have also found success elsewhere. We see ourselves as a live band. We play best on stage because we have an audience and can engage with our fans better that way. We want our fans to dance with us and have a good time. In their third album, Techari, the band introduced musical influences from Africa, Latin America and Asia. They were awarded the Latin Grammy in 2006 for the album. It's one of the top accolades for Spanish language music worldwide. Ojos de Brujo have just released their fourth album, Ao Canal. Twelve songs that are more melodious and less wild than their predecessors. The new album has the light-heartedness of the Caribbean. We were inspired by the rhythms of Cuba and Latin America. They were always a part of flamenco, but they really suit us. The musicians are also well qualified to play traditional flamenco music. Their fans especially like their modern takes on flamenco, a mix of hip-hop, 
and flamenco that the 12 musicians know will get their audiences on their feet wherever they are. We've moved to the side of the River Spree, which runs through Berlin, and behind me you can see the Border Museum, which is just one of five huge museums making up what is called Museum Island. If you come here for a visit, it's worth going there as there's something for everyone. To a smaller, more colourful collection now in Paris, which belongs to a man called Yves Gastou. Yves Gastou is a man who stands out from the crowd. In his store in the Saint-Germain-des-Prés district of Paris, he sells furniture and artworks from the 1940s to the 1970s. Chandeliers, leather armchairs, and writing desks from a range of different styles. A provocative mixture that already earned him the title of antique dealer of the future. We were the first dealers in the world to combine vintage furniture with creations by, at that time, young designers like Ron Arat and Tor Satsas or Shiro Kuramatra. Today, they are stars. Yves Gastou is an expert when it comes to finding hidden treasures. I've always kept things that were not really worth anything, but which have become extremely valuable in the meantime. I believe you can find true beauty in a bunch of plastic flowers, like the ones owned by many concierge here. There is beauty everywhere, not just in a painting by Picasso. You just have to recognize it. This chair by Italian designer Piero Gilardi is the only one of its kind. This is a chair for summer, a beautiful object. Almost all of Gilardi's works are in museums or private collections that are hard to find today. Clients include pop stars like Madonna, businessmen like Bernard Arnault, and fashion designers like Karl Lagerfeld and Stéphane Roland. They all place their trust in Yves Gastou's excellent taste. Many of them enjoy going upstairs to the floor known as the attic, it's home to many more items for which there was no room in the gallery. Before they even enter the boutique, a lot of people ask if they can go to the attic. Then they look at all the pieces, check out every corner. That gives them the feeling of discovering something. Yves Gastou lives 200 meters from the gallery with his son, Victor. His home is also colorful and unconventional. I must admit the furnishings are unusual for an antiques dealer. But at heart, I have remained a child. As you see, I like everything with curves. The desk by Italian designer Eric Calca is unique. Its first owner was the former French president, Georges Pompidou. And there are model figures everywhere, ones I collect with my son. And there's a wonderful work by French artist César. Some of the objects leave visitors unsure if what they're looking at is really art. But that's deliberate. Some of the pieces are so valuable, they belong in a museum. This chair by Shiro Kuramatra is my absolute favorite. It's called Miss Blanche. The artist used plastic roses set in plexiglass. Only 30 were ever made. The chair is valued at 300,000 euros, so whatever you do, don't sit on it. For a capital city, Berlin has lots of green areas. Here we are in a pretty central area, and you don't have to travel very far to find a park. Indeed, just over the road from the Reichstag, the German parliament building, there's a huge park called the Tiergarten that's the size of 200 football pitches. However, it's Britain that's famous for its parks and gardens, and one of the most beautiful is in Sissinghurst in southern England. Sissinghurst Castle Gardens, a symphony of colors, delicate and stronger shades depending on the time of year. 
They were developed back in the 1930s. Poet and author Vita Sackville West and her diplomat husband, Harold Nicholson, planned the gardens. Their granddaughter, Juliet Nicholson, still lives in the cottage garden house. So this is the South Cottage, which was my grandparents' cottage, the one that they chose to, uh, to live in to make their bedrooms here. And when they came here in 1930, there were no flowers in this garden. They chose to plant the first thing uh, against their own cottage. And this is what they chose. And uh, the rose is called Madame Alfred Carrier. The couple really left a mark on the gardens. Um, the garden at Sissinghurst is um, really a perfect a uh, symbol of the differing personalities of the two people who made it. She loved romanticism, he classicism. If you stand and walk all the way through that first arch, through the second arch, down the steps, and then across this lawn and all the way down to the statue at the very end, you have virtually one long straight line, the entire length of the garden. Vita Sackville West lived in the Middle East for several years and was influenced by Oriental garden design. She was a great fan of the magnificent English rose. She loved the opulent blooms, their velvety colors, and intoxicating fragrance. Some 160,000 visitors come to Sissinghurst each year. The garden is closed twice a week so that the gardeners can tend its sometimes 80-year-old beauties in peace. The gardens are divided into several so-called rooms by hedges and walls at head height. Every room is devoted to a special theme and a particular color. This is the white garden, and this was actually the last garden that uh, Harold and Vita planted after the war. It was an afterthought, which is sort of slightly ironic because it's definitely the most famous garden here at Sissinghurst. Vita Sackville West began to plant the white garden in 1950. She transformed it into a romantic dream. People come into this garden and they propose, sometimes they kiss each other. People ask to be buried in here. It evokes feelings of great emotion and romanticism. For the gardeners, preserving Vida Sackville West's legacy is not just a job, it's a privilege. We've moved again, and 20 years ago, I couldn't have stood here. I'm in the Sony Center on Potsdamer Platz, and for 28 years, the Berlin Wall cut right through this part of the city, and all this was a no-man's land. If you're a film buff, you might recognize where we are, as this is where the red carpet is rolled out for the Berlin Film Festival, which is nowadays on a par with Cannes. Keanu Reeves, Michelle Pfeiffer, just two of the Hollywood stars here at the last festival. Now, earlier this week, we visited René Birchner in Munich, who makes very special film posters. Someone in a hurry could easily overlook these movie posters. But each is one of a kind, hand-painted by Munich's last film poster painter. A piece of Hollywood on the outskirts of Munich, René Birchner paints his large-format movie posters in an old barn. In 1987, Birkner, a former art student, found himself in the studio of a renowned Munich movie poster artist by chance. It led him to his profession. I saw these huge surfaces, and the way they were painting became clear to me right away, because someone was working on the pictures right then. I was impressed, and I thought, I could do that too. 
And I'd like to. Und da dachte ich mir, Mensch, das kann ich doch eigentlich auch, das würde ich gerne machen. Now, Birkner's works can only be seen at a handful of cinemas in Munich. One of them is the Filmtheater am Sendlinger Tor. For four decades, Fritz Pressma has managed this movie house, which dates back to 1913. Pressma says mass-produced posters are out of the question. The magic is that they're individually designed. For us as a cinema, that's very important, because 15 years ago we could create our own newspaper ads, so the house had its own branding. Today, the distributor controls everything centrally. There's one ad motif for all of Germany. And this is the last place, the last refuge, where a cinema can still set its own very personal tone. Wilkna gets new commissions every Monday. For example, the poster for the new Harry Potter film. Each poster costs around 1,000 euros. They have to be finished three days later and hanging on the cinema's facades. New pictures are painted on old canvases over the old posters. There's little time for nuance or detail. A Munich bank is now staging an exhibition of Birkner's favorite posters. The painter himself loves broad, vibrant fields of color and striking portraits. The exhibition honors an almost forgotten craft. While Harry Potter dries without the aid of sorcery, René Bilkna continues with his next subject, U.S. actor Tom Hanks. Standard movie posters have changed a lot over the last 20 years. Graphics don't play a major role. They don't try out different styles. The whole genre has changed a great deal, and for painters, it's no longer very interesting. They've all become too similar. So interesting, it's relatively the same. Hand-painted film advertising conveys real emotions. And if you keep your eyes peeled as you stroll through Munich, you might spot a genuine Birkner. I'm now in Townsendstrasse, which is an area where you can literally shop till you drop. Just over the road is KDW, that's Kaufhaus des Westens, which is the Berlin equivalent of Harrods, where you can get everything. And they have a particularly good food hall on the top floor. But basically around here, there's everything, including the obligatory fashion boutiques for the ladies. I'm sure some of them include creations from Tamás Narai, who comes from the Hungarian capital Budapest. Bold, colourful and always elegant. His collections have made Hungarian designer Tamás Narai a celebrated name in the international world of fashion. To me, fashion is about creating a sense of lightness in our lives and about looking a bit different from everyone else. Fashion is a tool we can use to change our world slightly. This studio in Budapest is where Tamás Narai brings his ideas to life. The designs first begin as sample pieces. Each garment is tested with different cuts and fabrics, and each piece is given a personal touch. I like fabrics that are a bit witty. I really enjoy playing with fabrics and colors, with turquoise and green. And this here is a piece of tulle, which we're sewing here in a rather ingenious way to make the garment have a bit of swing and liveliness in it. Tamash Narai is always on the lookout for new colors and shapes for his designs. He's never lacking in inspiration. I don't know myself where my ideas come from. Many times when I have a new idea, I start sketching right away. I have a sketching set in my car. I have one in the kitchen, the living room, when I'm watching television and when I'm reading, in case I have an idea. A new stitch, a piece, how I want it to look. If I don't draw it immediately, I'll forget my idea. 
Tomash Narai's fashions are available only in his own boutiques. He prefers to attend to his international clientele himself. These days, he only designs for women because men's fashion wasn't exciting enough. When men choose clothes, it's very fast. They try them on, we make alterations, they pay and leave. Well, thanks. That's not much fun. But women try on hundreds of items and get crazy over them and smile and create a sense of energy and excitement. It's a very positive atmosphere and I find it great fun. It is really enjoyable. Currently, Tamash Narai is putting the final touches to his fall and winter collection. The designer always enjoys the last modeling sessions before a new collection is launched. These final moments are wonderful, right before the clothes are presented on the catwalk. It's wonderful and very exciting. The fabrics were all chosen a year ago, then I sketched the designs, and now we finally have the clothes, and they're all done, and it's truly wonderful. The new collection will hit the runways in September and will appear in Tomash Narai's boutiques shortly afterwards, including in two new showrooms opening in Moscow and Dubai this fall. If you're wondering what this strange-looking building behind me is, it's the Kaiser Wilhelm Gedächtniskirche, the memorial church. It was badly damaged in the Second World War and the ruins were left standing as a reminder to us all. Now, today Berlin is a popular tourist destination and there are certainly plenty of them around right now. In our final report, we go to Italy and to a very popular destination for German and Italian tourists. Its many beaches and unspoiled nature make Puglia, or Apulia as it's also known, a very special place. The harbour city of Bari, with its 320,000 inhabitants, is the capital of this region in southeast Italy. Well known for its university, Bari has seen a number of rulers come and go over the centuries. The ancient Greeks, the Romans and the Byzantines to name but three. They've all influenced the city's architecture. Bari has always been a magnet for artists in search of inspiration. The church of St. Nicola dates back to the 12th century. The cultural diversity is reflected in the architecture. You can see that both in Bari and the surrounding region. Bari's castle is another reminder of the region's turbulent history. The Alta Murgia National Park is to the west of Bari. It's home to the octagonal Castel del Monte, which was built around 1230 by Emperor Frederick II. Further north, in the Gargano district, this family makes pottery in the style of the ancient Daunian people who settled here 1,000 years before Christ. Well, what interests me, what I like most about Downian style, are the geometric linear designs, although this evolved over time into something more elaborate. Albero Bello, southeast of Bari, is renowned for its round houses, called Trulli. The building form is said to date to the 13th century. The buildings used to be home to peasant families. And because the truly weren't seen to be proper houses, the inhabitants didn't have to pay taxes. This is a typical trullo. It's a small trullo, but a large family would have lived here once. Seven or eight people would have lived in here. In contrast, you can find all the modern-day comforts in the luxury hotels on the coast. The five-star Baia del Faraglione in Matinata offers rooms costing up to a thousand euros per night. The hotel has its own private beach. At this time of year, most of our guests come from Germany and Northern Europe, as well as a number of visitors from Russia. 
This is a fertile region and the sea is famed for its rich variety of fish. Visitors can enjoy freshly caught lobster, octopus and sea bream in the local restaurants. And there are many ways to prepare them. The people here are said to be laid back with a love of life. And anyone who visits the region will long to return time and time again. And that wraps up our special show for this week. If you'd like to see any of it again, you'll find it on YouTube. Type in Deutsche Welle English and there's all sorts to choose from. We've had a great time out and about here in Berlin. We hope you did too. So from the Brandenburg Gate, bye-bye and auf Wiedersehen.